several of, of our colleagues and I thought that this would be a great opportunity. This was the first hyaluronic acid product that was stable, uh, that was um, very different from the uh, collagen, uh, uh, you know, bovine-derived collagen products that had been around for a while that were really very unsatisfactory in lots of respects. So uh, we saw an opportunity to break into a new category, dermal fillers that were safe and long-lasting and could be accepted widely uh, and could be used easily by practitioners. So we bought the product and um, ran the clinical trials in the United States to get it uh, approved by the FDA, did so, and ultimately launched the filler category in the United States. Mm -hmm. So Metasys is really where it all started with fillers in the U.S., right? Yes. And that would be with you as the founder. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Technology of Beauty, where I have the opportunity to interview the movers and shakers of the beauty business. And today is no exception. With us today is Jonah Shacknai. He needs no introduction, but those, of, those few of you that don't know him well are going to get to know him today and all the things he's done and contributed to the aesthetics business, the beauty business, if you will. Welcome, Jonah. Thank, Thank you so much for coming down to the studio today. My Appreciate it. To be here, Grant. It's thank such you. an honor to have you on this show. And uh, again, thank you very much. So let's start with this. Where did you grow up? Where did you where did yeah. you hail from? I grew up in New York City. Uh-huh. Uh, and of course that never leaves you, though I've been on the West Coast for many decades. Uh, there's still a certain energy and fun when going back to New York and just being around familiar things. Yes. So how did you get involved in the beauty business? And when and where? Well, we were uh, at Metasys, the company that I founded and was associated with for many years, two decades. We were the largest independent dermatology business in the United States. Prescription. I have to stop you. We have to start with the founding of Metasys. You jumped right into that. You formed Metasys. You're the founder, right? And the I CEO am. and chair, chairman and so forth. Well, yes. tell us about the day you decided to form Metasys. Well, I was uh, a young guy uh, in my late 20s and uh, had a pretty good uh, group of experiences on Capitol Hill where I was a, a principal aide to the committee that had jurisdiction over the health care economy, the Food and Drug Administration and other agencies. Uh, I also had the privilege to work at a company called Key Pharmaceuticals uh, where I was sort of the principal advisor between the chairman and the chief executive officer. And felt uh, when that company was sold that, you know, it would be time to sort of uh, go out on my own and try to find an opportunity. It was the hubris and naivete of a young guy that had nothing to lose. Because I think if I'd looked at uh, our prospects objectively, I probably never would have had the courage to do it. But, you know, I had a few dollars in my pocket and I was full of, of piss and vinegar and uh, ready to go. So um, in, in really looking for a category, I tried to find an area of medicine that I thought was underserved. Uh, a lot of the major pharmaceutical companies that had maintained very large, successful dermatology businesses were leaving. They just picked up and left and focused on rheumatology and diabetology and uh, cardiovascular disease uh, because the dollars were just so much bigger. Uh -huh. And I knew because I knew so many dermatologists uh, that were colleagues that there was really this feeling of abandonment uh, that these large companies that had served them uh, well with good drugs and great service just picked up and left very unceremoniously. And I sensed that if we were a company that could really become the dermatology company, which we did, and really focus with exquisite attention and commitment to this sector, this specialty, that we could do well. And, you know, the hypothesis was correct. The route was not always uh, as planned uh, as with any company that at that time was a startup, but it was a lot of fun and we're very proud to, to end the way we did. Uh, what year was this uh, that the, you started? We sold our first product in 1990. Okay, so we're talking late 80s, 1990 you started. Yes. And when you, when you first started Metasys, was it all dermatologic goods or what, what was your emphasis when you started? I know you, you expanded, sure. but what, it was exclusively topical dermatology products. Okay. And then over time, uh, we developed the product line. It became more sophisticated. Uh, we developed oral antibiotics for the treatment of acne principally. 
And, you know, along the way, we actually had the largest dermatology product in the world, a product called Solidine, uh, which was an oral antibiotic for the treatment of acne, but really changed um, the, the sort of fashion of antibiotic use in the treatment of cutaneous disease. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we started as a small company with relatively unsophisticated products and really invested uh, intensely in research and development along the way and became the scientific thought leader in dermatology. And when did you get involved with the injectables, namely Restylane? Yeah, so we got involved um, really in the mid-90s. There was a, a Swedish company called QMed, mm -hmm. and we had uh, had some early conversations with them. They were the inventor of Restylane and were selling it in Europe and Canada at the time. And uh, several of, of our colleagues and I thought that this would be a great opportunity. This was the first hyaluronic acid product that was stable, uh, that was um, very different from the uh, collagen, uh, uh, you know, bovine-derived collagen products that had been around for a while that were really very unsatisfactory in lots of respects. So uh, we saw an opportunity to break into a new category, dermal fillers that were safe and long-lasting and could be accepted widely uh, and could be used easily by practitioners. So we bought the product and um, ran the clinical trials in the United States to get it uh, approved by the FDA, did so, and ultimately launched the filler category in the United States. Mm -hmm. So Metasys is really where it all started with fillers in the U.S., right? Yes. And that would be with you as the founder. Well, uh, it, would, it was a group effort, uh, many colleagues involved uh, from the business side, from the research and development side, but, you know, I signed the front of the checks, so that was... Well, you know, they talk about the fish riding from the head down. I think it right. goes the other direction also. Well, and that showed great forth foresight on your part. And now look at the look at the industry now, the filler industry. It's unbelievable how many fillers we have, right? It's it is. I mean, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. And, you know, some are better than others. Mm -hmm. I think Restylane has stood the test of time. Uh, Juvederm is obviously a very strong player in that category. Um, you know, some, um, I, I never liked the so-called longer lasting fillers that had uh, really inorganic uh, materials in them. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, the late Arnie Klein, who was a, who was a friend, um, used to go around and say that uh, permanent fillers cause permanent problems. And Rick Glogau, another real thought leader in, in uh, the filler category, uh, also was very concerned that many of these fillers, which had uh, odd substances in them, not hyaluronic acid, really could go on to create a, a permanency that would be difficult to deal with medically. Yes, and we've seen that. I yeah. mean, their, uh, their concerns have actually been borne out. An example would be people that uh, uh, injected silicone. Right. Or other products that uh, cause problems. Okay. So, <clears throat> Metasys, you were running it for, what, 25 years or so? Something like that, yeah. yeah. And then eventually somebody bought Metasys. Yes. Uh, we received an unsolicited offer um, that was difficult to refuse. I would have preferred not to sell the business. There's no question about that. I'd love to still be doing what I did for many years. Uh, but I think our board of directors understood that it was a fair offer uh, good for our shareholders. We were a New York Stock Exchange listed company. So, you know, at the end of the day, uh, there comes a point where you just don't have a lot of choice as a public company. And we reached that moment. Mm -hmm. And what year was that? Uh, that was the in, Valiant bought Metasys? It was uh, in two th late 2012. Okay. So then you're, you're let go. I mean, you sell the business. And what did you start doing next? Yeah, well, I wanted nothing to do with them going forward. No. Uh, so despite having uh, been encouraged financially to maintain a relationship with them, I, I just couldn't see doing it. I didn't like the management of the company. I didn't feel that they treated customers or employees fairly and appropriately. So I got out of there as fast as I could, which was the day the deal closed. Mm -hmm. uh, at you know some financial sacrifice, but I just couldn't have been associated with that kind of uh, management uh, team. Uh, and, of course, they've been discredited uh, and shamed uh, since then. Uh, so we went on uh, over the course of a few years with several medicist colleagues to form Skin Better Science, mm -hmm. uh, which has become one of the leading professional skincare companies. But a lot of medicist people are associated with it, and a lot of people that weren't at medicist that are also huge contributors. So tell us about Skin Better Science. It's very interesting, the story and the, and the people you have around you. So let our audience know about Skin Better. 
Well, Skin Better has emerged. Uh, we just celebrated our fifth anniversary of products in market, and we've emerged as one of the fastest growing and one of the largest professional skincare companies, starting from a, a dead stop uh, five years ago. Incredible. So, well, we're, we're proud of what we've done and, and, you know, very committed to having a, an even brighter future. Uh, so we have a pretty full product line that really um, it has a couple of unique characteristics. First, I think our products are more sophisticated clinically and scientifically than the other things out there. Uh, we all have a pharmaceutical heritage at the company. Mm -hmm. So we develop products as if we're going to put them on the doorstep of the FDA. Of course, we never have to. But all of our products have very well-controlled clinical trials uh, behind them. They're using uh, all of them patented uh, materials and substances that really, I think, give us a, a pretty clear edge. We've won more awards than any other company in the business. Just in five years, we've surpassed those companies that have been around for 20 years. Uh -huh. So I think there's a, a pretty clear recognition that our products have a scientific superiority over many competitors. The other feature that's really critical is our channel fidelity. So unlike every other company in the industry, you can't buy our products online. You have to be a, a, a clinical practice, uh, an aesthetic practitioner with a medical degree uh, to be uh, in our world of skin better science. And although we have a Practice Connect program uh, where consumers, where patients can go online and identify their physician, uh, essentially receiving an invitation to buy products, every transaction that we have involves uh, sharing the revenue with the practitioner. Mm -hmm. So there is not a single sale uh, of a Skin Better Science product in the United States that doesn't involve this split between the company and practitioners. And that's been very, very well received. And again, we're the only company that does that. Are you distributed outside of the United States? Uh, to a limited degree, we are. Uh, would that include Asia? It would include Europe, um, the Australian, New Zealand uh, world, Scandinavia. Um, we really don't have a big business in Asia at all. And when you're distributed OUS, say New Zealand, Australia, is that through physicians' offices also? It is, uh, where it's legally permissible. There are some European countries where physicians are not allowed to sell products out of their office. Okay. So we again create this online nexus so that the physician is credited for the sale. So I it's see. a very consistent sales model everywhere in the world. And where's the home office? The home office is in Phoenix, where Medicis was headquartered. And again, there, there's so many people that were associated with Medicis that it seemed reasonable to have the office there. And is that where most of the science is being done and the research? It is. You know, we have uh, facilities around the country. So, uh, it, but certainly the nidus of work is being done in Phoenix. And, you know, it's obviously been very challenging in the COVID environment to be there as often as we all like to. Sure. But uh, Phoenix is kind of the spot. It's been a lucky city for us and we've stayed there. <laughs> Do you have a key ingredient or a key product within your product line? Like for instance, you know, think of uh, Skin Medica and TNS or think of Elastin with the trihex peptide. Do you yeah. have a, a focal point that from which you grew? I'm glad to tell you that we don't. Okay. Uh, every product stands on its own, whether uh, it's our retinoid family, uh, the Alpharet family, uh, whether it's our uh, Sunbetter uh, products, whether it's our Alto, which is, I think, the most potent antioxidant uh, in the world. They all have uh, unique platforms and unique patent positions. So we took the view that we're not a singular technology company but rather a company that's technology agnostic. We want to develop or in license the best technology that we can find. And we don't feel that having this uh, sort of smorgasbord of opportunity with ingredients has been in any way limiting, actually to quite the contrary. So we're not a big company for line extensions and trying to flog the same ingredient across uh, six or seven applications. To the contrary, uh, we have unique things for every application, and, and that's a fundamental element of our business philosophy, not to be wedded and feel that we've got to make one thing work everywhere, but rather make the right thing work where it should. Uh -huh. And what sort of growth, you mentioned they've done it five years, and they're one of the lead or the leading company in terms of growth. What are we talking about now in terms of, let's instead of just dollars, how about number of offices that you have, say, in 2021 versus 2020 or 2019? Can you give us a feel for your growth in terms of the number of offices yeah. or 
some some so we're in about like we're that. in about four thousand offices, and okay. of course, you know, if you extend it to their patients that have a continuity online, it's you know hundreds of thousands of patients. We've sold millions of units, uh-huh. so um, that probably has doubled in the last three years. Okay, um, and you know we're very selective about the practices that we go into. It's you know it's easy to open up an account and sell them a hundred dollars worth of stuff a year. Um, we tend to focus on those practices that are really high impact, that have great reputations locally and are able, from our point of view, to be able to move product that, that makes it worth the attention that they're going to get. We have a lot of educators. We supply a lot of service elements to the offices, and we can't do that everywhere. So we've got to be pretty selective with our distribution points. And you sell to derms, of course, and plastics and yes. probably the other core specialties at least. Yes. We sell to any MD um, what is, let's say a gynecologist, general surgeon, general practitioner? We don't call on them. There are laws in the United States, and we encountered this at Medicis, where we can't legally not sell to them if they come to us. Mm-hmm. But in terms of all of our promotional activities with our talented sales force, with any other outreach, we're really in the core exclusively. Okay. And you mentioned Salesforce. How many salespeople do you have in, in, uh, in the company? So today we have 35 uh, sales reps plus managers. Uh-huh. And, you know, we have grown that incrementally. We started with 20. I can imagine us getting to 40 or 45, but really don't see the need to, to extend much beyond that. And what are your plans with the company? Well, the plans are to continue doing what we do. Are um, you going to take it public? No, I, that's, you know, the, the lesson from medicine is being <laughs> a public. Where I'm going. Yeah, that's just I, where I'm it's, going. A, it's a great question. So <laughs> I mentioned earlier that um, I, I was not thrilled that Medicis was sold. Right. You know, it was the right thing to do. But you're a publicly traded company. You're a publicly you're traded company. Got, you know, I and all of our employees did extremely well financially. So no one's crying poor. It's really, it's more about philosophy than dollars. So uh, Skin Better Science was organized to be very tightly controlled. We have one financial partner uh, plus me. We have a very tight governance uh, element. So this company will not be sold uh, involuntarily. Uh, and we have no plans to sell the company. To the contrary, we want to build it. And, you know, we can see ourselves becoming a $200 plus million dollar company within the next few years. And, and as importantly, to have uh, viewed by the public – uh, the most scientifically innovative and interesting products, disruptive products. And some of the things that we're working on now for the future are really extraordinary. I mean, I wouldn't have dreamed this uh, possibility 10 years ago. Which brings me to my next question. It's a little premature in this program, but I, I'd be remiss if I didn't go there. What's coming down the pipe for that company? And do you have any appetite for non-topicals? Are you thinking about injectables again or uh, other yeah areas of like device or breast implants or if you can share that with us what's the future for that company yeah so our mandate is really pretty tight Um, we are organized to provide non-prescription products to the market so uh, we don't really talk about what's coming next we have a launch meeting uh, imminently we typically launch three to four new products a year all of them highly innovative Mm -hmm. and disruptive hopefully um so with, with that mandate of being a non-prescription product, we look at lots of different possibilities. And I, I can tell you that we are developing things that would be unexpected, not really devices, but other, other applications that would uh, be of benefit to skincare. Are we going to hear about a toxin? Uh, well, again, you know, with the idea that we are a non-prescription company, oh, okay, okay. Uh, you know, we really uh, spent a lot of time at the FDA. We got 41 out of 41 products approved at Medicis. That was a wonderful experience and very educational. The mandate of Skin Better Science is to uh, have as little uh, regulatory entanglement as possible because we really want predictability to our business. We're running our products as if they're going to go to the FDA. We have extensive uh, clinical research that backs up every product, not a couple of photographs and mom and pop stories, but really uh, highly controlled clinical studies with very reputable investigators. So we are sort of pretending that we're in the pharmaceutical business, but we stop at the FDA's doorstep. That's fantastic and to be applauded 
good job. I mean, that's what we need, more science yeah. and more development. That's, that's fantastic. I'm so happy to hear that as a member of the aesthetics community myself. And we esteemed, need more uh, science. An esteemed member, president <laughs> of every association. Well, yeah. you're very kind. Now, yeah. I know it's not your nature to uh, brag and so forth, but I also know you're a, ph a philanthropist and you have a, a heart. And uh, tell me, what, what things speak to you? What are, where are you active in terms of uh, philanthropy? Well, we have a family foundation um, that's named after my late son, the Max A. Shacknai Foundation, and that's a focal point for a lot of activity. Uh, we also have an organization called Max in Motion, mm -hmm. which provides scholarships, um, now over 12,000 of them, to youth um, athletes, um, those that you know play soccer or um, Various uh, sports were able to pay their fees uh, when they're economically challenged and wouldn't have the ability to compete. We also have a college preparatory program for those young athletes, uh, particularly those that wouldn't typically be on a college track. And we also um, have a program for those people that have uh, disabilities. So we work with a, an organization called Ability360 that provides wheelchair uh, sports activities for uh, kids that, that have one disability or another that would otherwise limit them from participating in sports. So that's, that's and um, I'm also an officer of the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. I feel very passionately that smoking cigarettes, uh, vaping, um, any sort of ingestion of tobacco and nicotine products is massively harmful uh, to kids, to adults, and we're actually the largest tobacco control organization in the world, and I feel very strongly about that as probably being the uh, single most preventable uh, cause of death and uh, morbidity in the United States and the rest of the world. So did you hear that? Max in Motion has contributed to 12,000 scholarships. Is that what I heard you say? Yeah. 12,000. And that's that. your personal... Uh, it's, yeah, I mean, I have certainly friends that have contributed to maxinmotion.org. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's, it's largely been funded by our family, but uh, many generous friends have been important contributors. Well, that's fantastic. And when you talk about scholarships, are they all college scholarship, scholarships or are any of them pre-college? Yeah, these are all pre-college. So what we're essentially doing is, is paying for the uh, fees, the training fees of kids that would like to join clubs. Um, in a number of different sports that are all team sports. Mm -hmm. So it, it can cost uh, thousands of dollars a year for sure. young athletes to be able to compete and hopefully be on a, a track that gives them um, great experience with interdependency, team sports. Uh, it certainly keeps them from engaging in other activities. So we tend to be focused in areas that are challenged economically or socially. Um, and, you know, those are the kids that typically um, come from families that can't afford these really expensive training fees. It's a lot more than people imagine. It's not um, soccer for six-year-olds. You know, <laughs> these are teenagers, and it's literally thousands of dollars a year to participate in these clubs, to travel, uh, to purchase equipment, and we underwrite those fees. And where's the home office or offices? Well, the home office is in Santa Barbara. Okay. Uh, but our activities have really been limited so far to Arizona and Southern California. And how would someone get a hold of uh, you or get a hold of the office if they are interested in hearing more about sure. this? Sure. Well, we have a website, maxinmotion, one word, dot org, and uh, that's the best place to gain further information. Okay, we'll show that on the on the uh, Chiron here. Oh, thanks. And uh, Max in Motion is where it's at. And I would encourage you guys to check it out or check out Jonah's, uh, his, uh, his own websites and so forth, as I did. Uh, so um, so <clears throat> you're in the aesthetics business. You, you are contributing greatly to the community that you're in and have been and where you were at, with uh, Metasys and so forth. What else is going on in your life? I know you have children. Yeah, well, I've got uh, four kids and, you know, spend a lot of time with them. Uh, and it's really a pleasure to be able to do that. It's a source of a lot of joy uh, in my otherwise busy life. Yeah. Uh, and of course, you know, when, when you're a uh, founder of a company, uh, it requires intensive activity, working with colleagues, uh, reviewing journal articles. You know, the, the, the day goes by very quickly. And I think it's actually gotten worse in the, in the COVID and sort of post-COVID crisis environment. Um, I think now because of Zoom and, uh, and 
telephone accessibility, people expect that you're available 24 seven. Whereas I think when there was a, a more office uh, driven environment, there was sort of a recognition that at the end of the business day, uh, people would go back to their families and carry on with their work. I've always viewed my job as 24 seven. I've been the chief executive of these companies, but I think it's been intrusive for others because they now feel that they've got to be responsive, um, you know, even when they go home and should be spending time with their families. I couldn't agree with you more. And a number of other things have happened also. We're staring at our faces more, especially men. And uh, this concept of Zoom lifts and all the Zoom aesthetics that the Zoom uh, phenomenon has uh, stimulated. And speaking of which, have you seen that in your business, that the COVID uh, the COVID effect with more consumption of your beauty products? Because we certainly have seen it in plastic surgery. Yeah, I, I think the answer is yes. I mean, we were on a very steep growth curve anyway. Hard to tease so, that out. So, yeah, it's probably. very hard to tease it out. Certainly the number of consumers that visit our website at skinbetter.com has increased dramatically. Uh -huh. And, you know, that's either due to just our being around longer and establishing more credibility with physicians and patients, or it could be a COVID-factored environment. Jonah has another uh, trait, habit, that uh, he's the only person that I know who does this. He consistently reaches out to us and wishes us a happy birthday long before the social media phenomenon of reminding you of whose birthday it was. And not only that, he calls you and wishes you a happy birthday. When did you start that and how did that all start? It's amazing which, that, that you can even do it. And you're well known for it. Yeah, well, I guess we all have to be well known for something. Better, <laughs> well, that's a wonderful Better that thing. than forgetting about people. Well, that's uh, true. But yeah. tell me about yeah. how that started. Well, uh, early in the days of Metasys, um, we had relatively few customers. You know, we were a startup company and sure. there were hundreds of dermatologists writing our products as opposed to the tens of thousands that ultimately emerged. And I, I felt that it was really important from, from me on down in the organization to create a, a sense of partnership and affinity uh, with those customers so that we were really involved in the tapestry of their lives. Uh -huh. So uh, the best way to do that as a starting point is to understand when someone's birthday is. It's a day when, you know, people, it's about them. Yes. It's the one day a year when you're allowed <laughs> to celebrate yourself or forget about it as time marches on. Um, so I, I gleaned by asking people when their birthdays were, and I made it a point and still do to call them on their birthday and wish them a happy birthday. You know, it, life has marched forward. So as, as many of those calls as I make, and I'm sure it's several thousand a year, I've also had the, the sad occasion to call people when they experience loss or something happens in their life. So it's, you know, we, we want to be there for the happy moments. But I've often said to my colleagues that when you have a relationship with a customer, you really want to be part of the tapestry of their life. So most things are positive, birthdays, weddings, uh, other family celebrations, but sometimes there's some sadness. And I think people uh, want to hear that you're concerned and interested. So, I, I, you know, as years have gone by, I've made more of those calls and several of them in the COVID environment. Mm -hmm. I've had six or seven uh, professional colleagues that have passed away or become debilitated. And, you know, I've wanted to reach out to their families and just let them know that, uh, that even though uh, their loved one is gone, they're not forgotten. That's so cool, Jonah. You're, you're such a loving and humanistic entrepreneur. That combination is what, what sets you apart. Well, and you're I'm not sure that's been said of me a lot, but you're nice to say that now. Oh, it's very true. So you've been in this business basically your entire career. Pretty much, yeah. yeah pretty much. After all your educational stuff. And you're, yeah. you're educated every day. I know that you never stop learning. And you've had the opportunity to see so much in the beauty business. And now as you look forward into your crystal ball, what do you see in the next few years with your companies as well as just in general? What do you see? Uh, what, will, what will the aesthetics world look like in one, five, ten years? Well, I think the, the pace of change is extraordinary. And social media has uh, empowered a lot of that and the change of perceptions and just the transparency that's been created. And some of it's good, some of it's not so good. Mm -hmm. um, it, it seems to me that that scientific intensity and integrity really will win the day uh, over time. Um, we're seeing now a commoditization of products, whether it's professional skincare, uh, whether it's uh, the neurotoxin market, whether it's 
fillers, uh, other modalities, energy devices, everything, you know, but surgery where techniques continue to evolve. And I think for a company to be meaningfully differentiated going forward, they can't just rest on their historical products and, you know, whatever image they've had with the community. They've got to really represent innovation and invest importantly in developing products that are going to be different, that are going to march uh, the, the category forward and be able to convince practitioners and patients that their stuff is new, different, and better. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, uh, the failure to do that is really going to lead to this price-driven commoditization um, of a market that you know has been very healthy. But if your products are no different and no better uh, than anyone else's, uh, inve inevitably, the only point of differentiation is either advertising or price. Right. Uh, and, you know, we're seeing that to a certain extent now in certain categories. So I would predict that the leaders in aesthetic medicine, if they want to stay leaders, are really going to have to double down um, on their investment, take more chances scientifically, invest in more programs and projects, many of which will never amount to anything, but with the hope that um, that in that haystack, there's that needle that really represents genuine innovation. That's what we're all about. You know, we have um, projects that are so far flung uh, right now. You know, many of them will not make it to market, but uh, our scientific curiosity and our, our drive to be disruptive really takes us in the direction of things that are really going to change the future, things at a, at a biological or molecular level that are not really palliative, but can really turn back uh, time, hopefully, mm -hmm. uh, on a cutaneous basis. Obviously, there's no substitute for surgery. And, you know, at a certain point in time, uh, these surgical procedures are critical, whether it's uh, on the face, on the body, and techniques continue to evolve to make recovery uh, a lot faster, a lot easier. But up to the point where someone decides to have surgery, we need to be able to make a meaningful difference. And again, I hope that, that our colleagues in the aesthetics industry will really appreciate that pouring more dollars into ads and doing things that really uh, don't advance the science of the category will, will ultimately be unproductive and will not allow uh, maintenance of leadership. I couldn't agree with you more. And I'm so happy to hear you say that. And you've always had that commitment to science and not the flim flam uh, hand rate, hand waving sort of marketing approach. And, um, we appreciate that. We in the, in the business, the physician, the core, if you will, plastic surgery, the Aesthetic Plastic Surgery Society, which you've always supported. Sure. And uh, your commitment and leadership is very appreciated. I want you to know that. Well, you're nice to I see I also it. appreciate you coming down today and joining us and sharing your story with our listeners. I know they've learned a lot and they realize why you've been so successful and how dynamic you are in the beauty business. So, well, And in, in life. And okay. you share a lot of basic good life lessons with us today. Well, and I want to thank you, Jenna. It's a pleasure when uh, the master calls, uh, people <laughs> respond. So no, it's no, not it's no wonder that this, this program has been so successful. So <laughs> Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you can see why I've wanted Jonah Shakti in this program since day one. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us today on the Technology of Beauty, where I have the opportunity to interview the movers and shakers of the Sorry. beauty business. And as you can see, Today was no exception. I look forward to seeing you all next week. Until then, stay safe. Bye-bye.